Thanks very much. Uh, pleased to be here, and I'm glad you're not asking me to speak in Finnish because I know no Finnish at all. So maybe you prefer that. But uh, anyway, uh, I was asked to talk a bit about uh, a, a variant of or an addition to the instruments that John Hurdy's talked about in the first session. He talked about the mental health instruments. I'm going to talk about the instruments that developed from that in the forensic sector. So by forensic, I mean people involved with the prison system, uh, crime, and so forth, and talk a little bit about the things that we've done within, uh, within INTRI uh, within that area. Uh, so I'm going to first talk about the needs for forensic assessment items, what they are, and how we got to a forensic supplement and a correctional facility instrument. I'm going to talk for the most time about a study that I did uh, in the state of Michigan using the correctional facility instrument and show you some of the results of that. And then I want to end up by just talking briefly about the brief mental health screener, which is a police screener. I'll just say a few words about that. So that's the agenda today, and I wanted to say that I acknowledge work done by, a lot of this work was done by others. Uh, I did the study, but the other stuff was done by others, and I borrowed slides from, and so for thanks to a variety of people within INTRI who have helped me in doing all of this. So in terms of developing a forensic supplement, when we did a survey of the world literature on forensic mental health, we found that there were really three basic instruments that had content that we had not seen. There was the psychopathy, uh, psychopathy checklist revised, the HCR-20, and the violence risk appraisal guide, so the VRAG. So those are the three instruments that we found that really had major implications in terms of measuring forensic problems that we really needed to have additional content to the mental health instrument. So what we did was we did not go to those instruments themselves. We pulled the concepts out of those instruments, and then we engineered items that would deal with the issues that they raised. Uh, we then used those to develop, develop those items, and then we did a, a testing for reliability and validity. I'm not going to have time to talk about that now, but there are articles describing that uh, on our website. Uh, the additional items that we needed, needed to capture forensic instruments that ended up with a one-page addition to the current RI MH or the intri MH. It takes about five to ten additional minutes to administer. So if you have a forensic environment, you can do the mental health instrument if, and then go on and do the supplement, this one-page supplement to bring out in information about forensics. Now, if you take the two instruments together, the mental health instrument and the forensic supplement, we put those together to develop a correctional facility instrument, the CF. So the, what was the content of this additional material? Well, it was additional mental status indicators, things like remorseful, remorselessness, impulsiveness, minimizes harm to others. It had information about criminal involvement, the best measures we were been told. Uh, to measure the criminality of a person is the multiplicity of types of crimes. And so there's a, a list of those types of crimes, so you can use that as a measure. Uh, use of weapons uh, in a crime. Social relationships, there were additional items, for example, around lack of empathy. And resources for discharge, whether or not, for example, they had unreasonable expectations of discharge. So those are the types of items that, that form the content of the forensic instrument. So let me say a little bit about the use that we made of this instrument in a study of mental health uh, department in, in not mental health department of corrections uh, in the state of Michigan. There was a public act in 27, uh, 27, uh, to, to 2007 that required an independent study to be done. Why is it going on? It just advances by itself. Excuse me. Uh, to look at the prevalence of psychiatric problems in Michigan. Uh, prisons and to look at how that match, matched with the provision of psychiatric care in these prisons. And we received a contract to take a look and perform a study to take a look at the relationship of these two. So what we did was we sampled 24 state prisons. We randomly chose them. Uh, in each case, we picked 150 prisons in each of four strata. Uh, we says it by itself, this magic. I, it, it seems to have an area direction and speed it wants me to go. Did you program this to make sure I got through faster or something? 
This is this is the new tech, a new technique that I I didn't know about. Uh, the male population, we we took general population, those people who were set in segregation, uh, and those people who were in special units that would be treatment units for mental health, as well as females. There were too few females to be able to break them out as well. So with each of those four strata, we collected information and we assessed 618 persons, and we used the intri correctional facility instrument. We also collected from the Michigan Department of Corrections records on mental health services that they had, and we're able to then weight that up to the full population of prisoners in Michigan, which is about just under 48,000 individuals. So as I said, the data collection used the intri correctional facilities. We didn't use it exactly the way it's designed. It's designed, as John Herdes was talking about earlier today. Boy, it really does love moving on. Uh, I think I'll just move, yeah, I'll move this away and see if that does a little bit better. Uh, so we use that, we use that instrument uh, as a survey instrument, and so therefore we had to make some sort of a, some adjustments. For example, it didn't make any sense to ask someone who'd be in prison for 20 years what was his drug use before he got into the prison. I mean, it, it just didn't, didn't make any sense, or, or ask him what was his drug use in the last few years. Either he'd lie about it, or he was using drugs, or not using drugs. It really was not very useful information. So we used it as, so we used it as a survey instrument instead. So now how do I move on? <laughs> so now I have a different problem. Let's see if that let's see if that works. Okay. We also asked we also had a psychiatrist involved with this, a forensic psychiatrist, and uh he inter he did 19 of the interviews. Uh he did it independently. He asked some additional questions. He did what he felt was the appropriate matter. We used this as a, as a validation study. Uh so we he independently did an assessment and we used that as a validation to see whether or not our measures of of whether a person had severe uh severe mental health illness and therefore was in need of services. We use that as a measure as well. We looked for outcome measures. We based it upon a set of scales. John Hurdy's talked about a lot of these scales. We had the cognitive performance scale, the depression rating scale, the positive symptom scale, the negative symptom scale, and a mania scale, and we determined that a person was on any of those scales at the severe level was considered to have a mental health problem in prisons. And so we worked with the Department of Corrections to make sure that they were comfortable with these measures. They signed off and said, yes, they were right, they were reasonable levels and so forth, and we moved ahead with the study. When looking at the psychiatrist assessment with people who would, would have had significant measures on any of those five scales, we found that that agreed very closely with the psychiatrist. On, nine, on 18 out of the 19, there was, a, there was a direct agreement. On the last one, there was only a disagreement about whether or not the person was competent to respond and that the psychiatrist was at the margin. So we felt it validated very, very well. We felt that was important for the state to do that, to use their psychiatrist to agree that we were measuring the correct thing. There's a reason why I'm saying all of this, and you'll see that in a minute. So let me talk about what our results were. Our results were that persons with a mental health trigger, uh, they were overall in the males, 20% of the males were triggered for any of the scale triggers and 24%, almost 25% in the females. And those are consistent numbers with other studies that have looked at prison populations. You can take a look at those, the, actually what they triggered in. For the most part, the men would trigger in the negative symptom scales if they picked anyone at all. And the females would generally be in the depression rating scale if they triggered on only one of the scales. This is probably the most important slide of the whole study, though, and that takes a look at our determination whether the person had mental health symptoms, either no symptoms or symptoms, and whether the Department of Correction was giving mental health services, no services and services. Clearly, if there were no symptoms and no services, that was appropriate. If there were symptoms and services, that was appropriate. The box here, which says that they meant that there were no symptoms but they were getting services, makes sense potentially that they were being, their problems were being controlled, they were being dealt with, and so therefore they were not manifesting symptoms. For example, they're on antidepressants, so they didn't have depression. So that box was fine. The one that we were concerned about was this box. And that was that we saw major symptoms and the Department of Corrections was not providing services. And that represented 65% of those people with symptoms. 
So only 35%, only a third of the people who had severe mental health symptoms were actually getting services in the Department of Corrections. Uh, that's put on this scale. And the other piece, which I am not able to show you because it's a little more complicated to display, was that, well, let me start by saying the following. I'm sorry, let me start my sentence again. Any service system is not going to have enough resources to care for everybody. And so the first comment that was made by the Department of Corrections was, well, of course we don't serve everybody. We just don't not given enough money by the state. But what the state, we, what we found was that as you moved up in the severity, it wasn't as the higher the severity, the more likely you got services. It was fairly constant. So people with low severity or even no severity were getting services, and people with high severity were getting at the same percentage were getting services. And so they weren't really doing the right thing. And therefore, our, what we said to the state was, Two things. One, you're not giving enough services. That's the only thing they heard. The second thing we said is you should target your services on those most in need of services. And they never heard that. And so the history of this is typical with many of these types of research. They took the study and they buried it. Okay? And although some people know about it, generally it's not been known and has not gone further. So very frustrating from a researcher's point of view, but the typical type of thing. They signed off on the study, they signed off on the measures, they signed off on the analysis, they signed off on how we got the answers. When we got the answers, they said it was a terrible study. <laughs> anyway, that's real life. We believe that this is a good measure and it shows how you can use the correctional facility instrument in that type of setting. Let me talk for just a minute then about the Brief Mental Health Screener, which is another of the products uh, that INTRI has. The problem that here was identified were the police, when they found, when they came to a case where they felt there was a possibility of mental health problems, they would want to take them to a hospital as opposed to taking them to jail, take them to the hospital to get mental health treatments. And the problem was that a squad car would take them, two policemen would go, they would sit in the emergency room, and they would sit there for three, four, or five hours waiting for the hospital to decide whether or not they were going to admit the person. They couldn't go anyplace else. They were not allowed to leave the hospital until the hospital accepted it. So there's an enormous amount of time by police sitting around just waiting for this decision to be made. And so John Hurdies and, and Ron Hoffman were involved with the study. Uh, and so I don't want to take the credit of what you did, John, uh, John Hurdies. Uh, but to take a look at this problem and see if you could use some of the mental health instruments and items for a better way to improve this particular process, to speed the intake process at, at the hospital and to decide who should go into the hospital. So this is designed for police and frontline service providers. It has the items to predict three scales, harm to self, harm to others, and the ability to care for self. I think, did you talk about all three of these to, this morning? I don't... Oh, you just talked about one of them. But anyway, there are two other scales. I'm sorry, I came in the middle of your talk, so I didn't hear all of them. Uh, there are 30 items in total. It, when you actually have done the assessment, it only takes another two, or four, two to four minutes to actually enter the data. Obviously, it takes longer than that to get the information, but they've already been doing the interviewing of the person to deter, you know, or their observations to determine that. And so the additional time is only two to four minutes. And what's happening is they are deciding better about who should go to the hospital and making those decisions better. When they get to the hospital, they're providing information from this form to the hospital, and they're speaking in the language that the hospital understands. And so the hospital listens to them and says, oh, you're saying you saw this, and therefore I can rapidly make a decision about this person. The waiting times have been halved as the, in the process of doing this. So it has been a very effective. It is now in seven policing districts in Ontario, and there are several others that are in, in the works uh, to be talked about. And here are some of the, the pictures of it. Uh, here, for example, is what it looks like in the squad car. It's actually a, it's done by one of our vendors. Uh, so it's just implemented, and they can just touch the screen and enter the information, and then it provides the answer on these various scales. And the other two pictures are uh, announcements that different districts are going to be adopting that instrument. So, Kitos. Uh -huh.